Okay, who likes money? I told you it was worth it. Who likes money? You, none of you. Oh, I'll just put it back in my pocket then. You, do you like money? Yeah? So, so. Do, okay, I'm not, this is not like a secret trap to see if you love money more than God or something like that, okay? Okay, pa parents, who likes money? Okay, yeah, lots of hands going up. There we go. Okay, it's safe to say yes. Okay. Um, who wants $5? None of you want $5. Okay, here you go. You can have $5. Why do you look so dubiously? Why does no one trust me? Do, you can have the $5. Here you go. What's wrong? I'm holding it. But I didn't say I was going to open my hand. I just said you could have it. Oh, oh did, did you want a shot? No. Okay. Um, what? What? Some tools, okay. <laughs> See, there's a problem, isn't there? See, I, I do have five dollars, and I'm going to keep my word. I will give it to someone, but they have to know how to get it out of my hand, don't they? Now, if I never told anyone how to get it out of my hand, no one would ever be able. Well, I mean, eventually I'd fall asleep, right? And you could probably take it out of my hand, but um, you wouldn't be able to get it out of my hand, right? And it would make it really, really hard to figure out how to get this $5 out of my hand. But what if I told someone? What if I told someone that all they had to say was Dutch people are great and they would get $5? <laughs> I mean, that would be pretty handy if I said, all you have to do to get this $5 is say Dutch people are great. And they would get $5. Oh, that's pretty savage. Dutch people are great all around. If, if you didn't hear it, Hannah just said Dutch people aren't great. So I guess she doesn't want $5. Um, but yeah, all it would take would be anyone in this room to say Dutch people are great and they'd get five bucks. Who said it first? Here you go, mate. Have five bucks. Congratulations to Jerome. There we go. That's right. Yeah, that's right, 100%. Um, so this was not just a sly means to talk about how great Dutch people are, but what it illustrates for us is that when someone lays out a way for us to do something, we're really smart if we do it, right? And in the Bible, God said to us, if you want success, if you want to thrive, if you want to walk forward rightly, this is how you do it. And he's given us a plan to follow. But sometimes we think, you know what, God, that's a great plan, but I actually know better than you. And so I'm going to do things my way. And what tends to happen is we fall flat on our face. But if we will just simply follow the plan God gives us, then we will have success. And in today's Bible story, we're going to be looking at some walls falling over. Anyone know what city we're going to be talking about? Jericho. That's right. We're going to see their walls fall down flat. And it's not because they used really clever strategy. It's not because they were powerful and big and strong. It's simply because they did what God said. And that's a wonderful lesson for you guys, that if you will just take God at his word and do what he says, then he will be with you. And he will do the things he promises. So let's pray and ask God to help us do that. Father in heaven, we thank you that indeed you have laid a plan for our lives and you have given us a path to follow. You've given us a book. And we pray that you'd help us to trust you. That, Lord, we would go into this war, war world and into this heavenly battle that lies before us. And we would fight according to the rules that you've set for us. Help these children, Lord, to faithfully walk before you as well. Help us to spur one another on, both child and adult alike. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to turn through to the book of Exodus tonight. As you would have picked up from the kids. Sorry, not Exodus. Joshua. We were in Exodus this morning. If you, as we would have picked up from the children's talk, we're looking at the Battle of Jericho, turning through to Joshua chapter 6. We'll read Joshua 6 just to give us a bit of a 
rundown of the story, and then we'll turn through to Hebrews as we carry working our way through that chapter. So that was Joshua chapter 6. And actually, we'll start at chapter 5, verse 13, because that's neatly tied to it as well. This is God's word for you tonight. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went in, none went out, and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat." And the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. So Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Go forward, march around the city and let the armed men pass on before the Ark of the Lord. And just as Joshua had commanded the people, the seven priests, bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns, before the Lord went forward, blowing the trumpets, with the ark of the covenant of the Lord following them. The armed men were walking before the priests, who were blowing the trumpets, and the rear guard was walking after the ark, while the trumpets blew continually. But Joshua commanded the people, You shall not shout or make your voice heard. Neither shall any word go out of your mouth until the day I tell you to shout. Then you shall shout. So he caused the ark of the Lord to encircle the city, going about it once. And they came into the camp and spent the night in the camp. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord And the seven priests, bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord, walked on, and they blew the trumpets continually. And the armed men were walking before them, and the rear guard was walking after the ark of the Lord, while the trumpets blew continually. And the second day they marched around the city once, and returned into the camp. So they did for six days. On the seventh day they rose early at the dawn of day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. Now just skip down to verse 22. But to the two men who had spied out the land, Joshua said, Go into the prostitute's house and bring out from there the woman and all who belong to her as you swore to her. So the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and mother and brothers, all who belonged to her, and they brought all her relatives, and put them outside the camp in Israel, and they burned the city with fire and everything in it. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and of iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rahab the prostitute and her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. 
Joshua laid an oath on them at that time, saying, Cursed before the Lord be the man who rises up and rebuilds this city Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn shall he lay its foundation, and at the cost of his youngest son shall he set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was in all the land. And then if you turn with me to the letter to the Hebrews, or the sermon to the Hebrews, I should say. Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to be looking at verse 30 today. This evening, next week, we'll be looking at Rahab, so you can keep that in your mind over the week, Lord willing. So it was Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. Amen. May God bless his word to us. And as we come to consider it, let's come and ask him for his help. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we long to hear from your Son, through whom you speak. And so we pray that as we, as we calm our hearts and sit before you, like small children, we pray that you would help us to hang upon the words of our God that they would reverberate through our head and heart, and they would flow out into every aspect of our lives, that we might live for you. Lord, would you give us joy in your word today? Would you fill our hearts with excitement and passion? And Lord, by your Holy Spirit, would you apply your word to our hearts? that we might love you and cherish you more and more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I worked for my father on the dairy farm for two or three years. I forget how long now. And we, we ran a farm that had uh, very uh, high input, which meant we had to buy in lots of feed had high stock numbers on a dairy farm, and so we used to bring in a lot of feed from outside. One of the difficulties of running a system like that is keeping nutrients up because they're not eating as much grass. You're bringing in a lot of dry feed for them. And so my father had created a very meticulous system for dealing with this problem. Uh, we would feed out maize every single day, twice a day, and when we fed out the maize, we would also include nutrients in the maize, which would top them up. Just, just really critical stuff for their general health and well-being. And Dad had created a system that would, that would cause the, the minerals and the nutrients to get evenly spread throughout all of the maize. And it was quite simplistic, but it was a little bit time-consuming. And so every time I went to feed out, I would have to go, and there would be sort of like seven or eight different big plastic drums that had had the top half sheared off, and measuring cups. And I'd have to take a very set amount of every type of nutrient, put it in the barrel, in the bucket, mix it all up. We would load up half of the maize, and then we would spread it all evenly, sorry, spread half of it evenly down one side, fill up the rest of the maize, and then spread the last half on the top. And, and Dad, of course, had been doing this for a number of years with great success. And so Dad had shown me through this process. He had taught me what to do. You can probably guess where the story is going very quickly. And... Logan thought he knew better. And you know, this, this whole putting half on and then half on, like it's not going to make a great deal of difference, right? If there's half in the middle, half at the top, we can all just stick it in the same place. And you know, we don't have to be that precise with the measuring. We can just sort of chuck it in there and then just yeet the whole lot on top of the maze and be done with it. Not a problem. Great. So off I go. Not a problem for the first week. Not a problem for the second week. Actually, not a problem for quite a while. But, but a few months later, all of a sudden... Um, our cows started losing their calves and we had cows dying of bloat and we had all sorts of different problems on the farm. We lost quite a number of animals and my dad was starting to like, what, what on earth is going, why am I losing all these animals? Why is all this problem 
out of nowhere, just mysteriously started. And, and, and eventually, Dad said to me, can you, what are you doing with the minerals? Like, it's just Show me through your process. And of course, I just did what I got down in the habit of doing. And you can imagine my father was very impressed when he discovered that I had caused the loss of quite a large number of his stock. Uh, to un yeah, he was very not impressed, we'll put it that way. And I was in a lot of trouble. I lost my bonus. My dad had a bonus system. I lost the whole bonus out the window, which was a very small amount compared to how much it cost my father. And what was the problem? I thought I knew better than my dad, right? I, I, I thought my dad's instructions weren't really worth listening to. And so I refused to do things my dad's way and wanted to take them into my own hand. And, you know, we, the church and um, Hebrew audience, we can be tempted to do the same, can't we? When we face, particularly when we face difficulties, particularly when we face trials, but in every time of our life, we can be tempted to say to God and to his word, I know better. We can be tempted to say, I know better. You know, the Hebrews were in that situation, right? I mean, they were facing... Uh, the onslaught of all of the Jews, Jerusalem, the wider area, Judea, just everything, right? They're facing this, this animosity and hatred of the Jewish people. And, and, and you know, the, the means that they had been given just didn't really cut the mustard, you know? When you've got people breathing down your neck trying to kill you, when you've got people kicking you out of the family inheritance, preaching doesn't sound very convincing. And prayer is just not really enough. And living a holy life is not really going to deal with the problem. And just suffering patiently in persecution just doesn't work. We need more, right? The Hebrew Christians were tempted to think we need more. This is just never going to work. And we can be tempted to say the same thing. I mean, let's be honest. We're in the same situation, right? Sure, we're not facing persecution, but look, look at the state of New Zealand. Is the kingdom advancing in New Zealand? It doesn't feel like it sometimes, does it? I mean, if you just take census statistics, there's way less Christians, whether they're Christians or not, leave that discussion aside. There's way less people that claim to be Christians than there used to be, right? There's more no religion than there is religion in New Zealand. And it just feels like everything gets worse. It does. It's not getting any better. Manuri was not more holy than it was 20 years ago, is it? You, do you feel more safe for the older people? Do you feel more safe now in Manuri than you did when you were a teenager? No. It doesn't work. We need something else. We could be tempted to look around at the difficulties that we face and think to ourselves, we need fancier, we need better, we need improved, we need skillful, strategical planning. And what the writer to the Hebrews wants to tell us is no. What we need is faith in God's appointed means. Because, as we just sung, the battle belongs to the Lord. We do not, as we saw this morning, we do not walk by sight, but we walk by faith. And so, firstly, as we unpack this reality, as we get teleported back to this historic war, this historic battle, the first thing we have to see is the prickly predicament that the Israelites were in. The prickly predicament that the Israelites were in. I mean, you've got to you've got to transport yourself back. Okay, I know we talked about the crossing of the Red Sea this morning, but the people have just crossed the Jordan. It's the second body of water they've crossed through. They've wandered through the Jordan River. They've been promised the promised land. They walk in ready to conquer, ready to take over. And what is looming before them? Jericho. Now, that doesn't mean much to us, right? Because we don't really understand, we don't live in a world of cities and walls and stuff, right? 
It, it's a very long way away from reality. Yes, I'm sure some of you have seen movies with these sorts of things in it. We've all seen Lord of the Rings, of course, which has some great battle scenes in it. But just set all of that aside. Try and teleport yourself in an imaginatory fashion all the way back to Middle Eastern old school warfare. There are no tanks, okay? And in fact, it's not that there's just no tanks. You don't even have siege weapons, Okay? And you're confronted with a city which blocks you from entering the promised land that has been standing for some four to five thousand years. So four to five thousand years, Jericho has stood as a city, as a prominent place in Canaan. And, and this city's so secure that we're told in Joshua 6 verse 1 that they just shut up shop. Did you see that? 6 verse 1, what do they do? No one goes in or out. They just shut the gate. They're fine. We're secure. There's no way you're coming in here. It's like Jerusalem at the time of David. Do you remember that moment when David says, uh, whoever conquers the city, whoever conquers the city can be the commander of the army. Do you remember what the Jebusites said? Huh, if we were just lime and bl blind and lame people, you would still never be able to come in the city. It's that type of a situation. The king and all of the inhabitants have said, look, we've got stores to last for years. We'll just shut the gate because, look, they don't even have a catapult. They don't even have a battering ram. There's literally no way they're ever getting inside of this city. It is heavily fortified. This is the type of city that the spies went in. Remember when the first set of spies go in and they come out terrified? What do they say? They have huge fortified cities. There's just no way we're ever going to get in there. It's ridiculous. Like, yeah, it's a great place. But have you seen their cities? They are in a very difficult predicament. This is a city which is impenetrable. And, and not only that, we're a bunch of ex-slaves, right? It's not like we've even got military experience. We've done a few battles on the way through, but it's not like we've got a sophisticated army. It's not like we've got warfare weapons. We've just got nothing. And brothers and sisters, I wonder if you feel the pain of that when you look around our nation. I mean, there's humanism, there's secularism, there's liberalism, there's genderism, there's sexualism, there's all of the different isms, Chuck communism, socialism, and all the other isms in there together. They are all right out our front door, aren't they? And they're in our workplaces, and they're in our schools, fortunately not this school, but in some of our schools, and they're in our families, and they're in our friendship networks, and they're breathing down our neck, and they're telling us or attempting to tell us what we can preach and what we can't preach, and they're trying to tell us what we're allowed to believe in, and they're telling us six-day creation is nonsense. I mean, the list could just go on, right? And they've got science on their side, and they've got technology on their side, and they've got the battle warfare on their side. And what have we got? I mean, what have we got? We've got nothing. We're not powerful. We're not rich. We're not influential. We've got nothing. Absolutely nothing. And you run into these people, and they've got all the answers, and they've got all the critiques, and they're all way smarter than us. And you get challenged in the lunchroom and you try and you just feel stupid. We find ourselves tempted to look elsewhere. We're, we're, like, we're so quick to become like Naaman. You remember Naaman? Naaman comes to the prophet and he, and he says, I want to be healed. And the prophet says to him, go wash in the river. Go, see Jordan over there, the, the filthy brown one? Just go wash in that one seven times. Do you remember what Naaman says? <laughs> what? I'm going home. I mean, I thought you would have told me to do something fancy. I thought you would have told me to do something great. Wash in the river. There's better rivers back home. Why? Because he didn't want to believe in the appointed means of God. He was tempted to think he knew better. And that's, that's us. It's my own heart. Be honest. It's tempting to look at a struggling church in New Zealand and think to myself, 
prayer doesn't work. I preach and people don't seem to get saved. I share Jesus with people and people don't seem to get saved. Maybe we need something else. You know, and, and the tension comes from both inside and outside, doesn't it? Temptation to, to conform and, and follow other means from other places. It comes from within the church. We look at other churches and they seem to thrive and they're doing, well, they're doing things that God doesn't tell them to do. Maybe, maybe we should do that too. And there's tension there. And there's tension from outside the world because there's experts that can tell us how to grow, how to, how to increase, how to get better, how to get stronger. And this pressure just bears down upon us. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, yes, they were in a prickly predicament, but they were also clothed with faith-fueled fortitude. Faith-fueled fortitude. You know, they, they stare at the walls. And I don't know how this conversation plays out, but, you know, you have this stunning interaction between Jericho and the commander of the Lord's army. It's just kind of amazing, isn't it? You realize that's like a pre-incarnate version of Jesus. It's the second person of the Trinity manifesting himself in the Old Testament. You know how we know that? Because Joshua falls down and worships him. And do you know what the angel doesn't say? Stop it. This is pre-incarnate Jesus as the commander of the hosts of heaven turning up and telling Joshua the plan. And now that doesn't surprise us. That sounds cool. I would have loved to have been there for that discussion. But what I would have been very interested to see is how the discussion of the battle plan happens after that. I mean, you can imagine Joshua's off by himself in the wilderness. He has this meeting. He comes back into the elders and the military leaders and whoever they are. And he sits down there and says, okay, Joshua, you had this, you know, spurring meeting with the commander of the hosts of heaven. What's the plan? He's like, don't worry. We've got the plan sorted. Oh, great. What's the plan? What we're going to do is... On, on, on Sunday, we're going to get up. It's not called Sunday, but first day of the week. On the first day of the week, we're going to get up. We're going to get in all of our military gear. They're like, yep, check, get it. Okay, got my sword, ready to go. Yep. Then we're going to make a big line, and we're going to have an ark, and we're going to have some dudes blowing the trumpets, and we're just going to walk around the city. Like, okay, we're going to make a surround them or something. So no, no, we're just going to walk around the city. Okay, and then what? Well, then we're going to go to bed. Like, oh, what do you mean? So, yeah, we're just going to go home, just go back to our tents, pick up. But are we going to, like, jeer at them and intimidate them? No, no, you're just going to be silent the entire time. Now, Joshua, I'm not following. I mean, can you maybe explain? Well, look, 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 the plan's not finished, right? So, so then day two, we're going to get up and we're going to do it again. And then day three... We're going to get up, we're going to do it again. The exact same thing. Yeah, yeah, literally. For six days straight, we're going to just get up and do it all over again. What, what are the elders thinking? Hey, Joshua, are you insane? This is the worst battle strategy upon the face of the planet. Have you seen the walls? They're huge. There's just no way that walking around is going to cut it. Why aren't we cutting the trees down and making siege ramps? That would make way more sense. We could make some ladders and climb them. Something, anything, but walking around the city, what would Joshua say? What would Joshua say to them? Would he say, it's a really smart plan? No, because it's not a smart plan. Humanly speaking, right? What would he say? The Lord has said we're going to walk around the city for six days straight. And God has said that on the seventh day, we're going to walk around that place seven times. And then we're all going to shout really loud and the walls are going to fall over. I mean, can you just imagine the faces of the elders gathered around Joshua? I mean, they're just going to be sitting there with their mouths open, right? Like, I think Joshua's lost it. Walls don't just fall over. It's striking though, isn't it? My, my beloved wife pointed this out to me that, that in verse 29, 
we're confronted with walls of water which stand up at the command of God and fall down at the command of God. And in verse 30, we're confronted with walls constructed by men which can fall down at the command of God, right? So what does Joshua say to them? Joshua says, we will walk silently for seven days. And on the seventh, we will walk silently seven times. And then we will shout and the Lord will knock down the walls. Why? Because God has said, because God has promised, because this is the means that God has provided for us to defeat Jericho. And so we don't look by sight, my dear people. We don't look by logic. We don't use feeble sense. But we look with the eyes of faith. And we walk and follow in the footsteps that we've been provided with. Calvin says beautifully, such a performance was childish and full of nonsense. It is, isn't it? It's childish and full of nonsense, but nevertheless, they obeyed the command of God and took it seriously. I mean, can you imagine? They strap their armor on. By faith, we're doing this, brothers and sisters. They put their armor on. They dress in their right gear. They get everything lined up and they march around the city like they mean business. Don't, don't forget the persistence this would have required. I, it's one thing to make that decision, right? It's another thing to walk around Jericho for a whole day suffering, not the whole day, one relap, you know what I mean, doing a lap around Jericho, suffering the ridicule of the people of Jericho. I mean, what do you think the people of Jericho are thinking? Look at these people. They've come all the way here to conquer us, and they're just walking around us. I mean, they would have heaped ridicule upon them. They would have been an utter laughing stock to the people of Jericho. But not only do they do it once, but you can imagine, right, day after day after day. We don't know how close they were. Or obviously, they weren't close enough for bow shot. But are they throwing stuff at them? I don't know. But you could imagine the ridicule and the hatred. And to persist, brothers and sisters, for seven days and seven times on the seventh day, over and over and over again. Why? Because they were by faith casting themselves upon the promise of God. And in the face of everything laying before them, they were not willing to give up. As the world derides them, they lay hold of the means of God and say, even in face of all obstacles, no matter how much doubt there may be, no matter how much the whole world or even the church thinks we are insane, we will do what God has required. Do you have that spine in you that by faith, a spine of faith that will look to what God has said and we will do it will be your reply. In the church, brothers and sisters, the church is filled with people that think they know better than God. It is filled with with people like Logan on the dairy farm who say to their father in heaven, I know better than you do. I will bring success to the church. And what we fail to remember sometimes, as John Brown puts it, the only means we are warranted to employ appear very ill-fitted to gain our object the preaching of the gospel, the prayers of the church, the holy lives of believers, and patience under persecution. And yet, these are the appointed means to overthrow the kingdom of darkness. It's not rocket science, brothers and sisters. God says, preach, pray, live, Suffer 
and the kingdom of God will not be overcome. It will not be overcome. Will we trust not just God's word, but will we trust God's word about how we ought to live and act? You see, God isn't so much interested in the results that we create as much as our faithfulness in how we live. God provides us with the way to do church. We have a book manual. I'll never forget listening to a, um, a preacher called Paul Washer, who's known for saying outrageous things. And um, he was sitting before a, a group of worship leaders. You know, in America, they have these big worship leader conferences and stuff like this. It's just place packed out with worship leaders. And, and he, he just asks the question at the beginning of his talk. He picks up his Bible and he says, I'd just like to know how many of you, you know, when you sat down to plan out how you're going to do worship in the church, how many of you picked up this book and read it to cover to cover in order to decide, to decide for yourself what you're going to do? And you can imagine, right, just crickets, absolute crickets in the room. Why? Because what they probably all did is either exactly what they had experienced in their life or whatever the latest book told them was the best thing to do. And that's the temptation for us, right? Rather than, not just for church leaders, but for every single one of us to open up the Word of God and say, God, what would you have me do? How would you have me live? How would you have me pray? How would you have me fulfill my part in the kingdom of God? But there's one thing we need to very briefly observe. And that is the, the wonderful Trinitarian triumph that we see. You see, the people went to war on behalf of the Lord, right? And they're confronted with, with the commander of the Lord. And it's by the spirit of the Lord that these walls fall down. You know, they trust themselves into God's care. They trust the plan of God. They follow, they do as they've been commanded. And what happens? The walls just fall down. Isn't it beautiful? The faithfulness of God. That in spite of all of the obstacles, in spite of all of their doubts, the Lord just does His work. And you know, brothers and sisters, we can experience the same thing. I'm not saying we're not. Please don't get me and misunderstand me. But this is God's plan for us. Jesus says, I will build my church. And he says, here's the methodology. And so we just do it. And he does the rest. He does the work. He builds the church. We take up the folly of preaching and we see people get built up. We just live a godly life and people get attracted to the church. We just get down on our knees and pray and people get converted. And God does it. And he's pleased to do it. And let me tell you why. Well, the reason why, brothers and sisters, is because he delights to do great things through small means so that he receives the glory. Because that's what it's all about. You know, God, God, could, have, God could have taken Jericho very differently. But God set up a plan that would ensure that every single person in Israel and every single person in the promised land who heard it would know that the only reason this happened is because of Yahweh. And this is what God is doing. This is why the Lord delights to use fools like me and weak people like us and the folly of preaching 
and the ridiculousness of prayer to advance the kingdom of God because then God gets the glory. God gets the praise. God gets the honor. When we follow God's means and God's systems, then as we just sung before, we sing glory and honor, power and strength to the Lord. Matthew Henry said this was the way God commanded them to take. And he loves to do great things by small and contemptible means that his own arm may be made bare. And it hasn't changed. Do you feel insignificant today? You look around the state of the world, you look at the work that needs to be done whether it's your loved ones that need to be converted, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's the state of the church, whatever it is, do you feel weak and insignificant? Praise the Lord. Because the Lord delights to use the weak and insignificant things of this world to shame the wise and the powerful and the strong and the rich. And may God do so for his glory and majesty here. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you have set up a path for us. We confess at times we're tempted to turn to other things and to despair of your ways. And yet we thank you for this wonderful reminder that in the cross of Christ, all folly is wisdom. That in the power of God, all weakness is perfected. And so we pray, give us faith to lay hold of your word and to do all that you have to say. Would you build up your kingdom, Lord? Would you push back the darkness in this land? Would you raise up a great host of men and women that would lay hold of your word and just faithfully walk and live and God help us to do it for our doubts assail us and we are weak of faith give us more faith Lord in Jesus name we pray Amen